man named Muzmajur Asham. Who he is really, I have no idea, but he purports to be a sort of insider with lots of insider information about various jihadi movements in, in Syria and in Iraq. And what he claims here um, is that the most significant factor in the group's decline was not the military campaigns, but rather what he calls the bloody struggles at Sira'at Demawiya over ideology within the group. Um, and he goes on to claim that some 1,400 people would die, were killed amid this conflict over the past few years, and hundreds more fled. Of course, all of this is very difficult uh, to verify. I think he's wrong that the military campaign was of secondary importance and that the ideological issues were more important. I think he's overstating his case, but it's still uh, a helpful reminder that this is an organization that was beset with internal problems, with tensions, um, and we're really starting to learn a lot more about those. And I'll return to the implications of all this stuff when I get um, to the end of, of this talk. Um, first, just a few words about, about sources that I use to, to understand what's going on in the Islamic State. There was a period um, when I was first starting to study this movement in 2013 and 2014, when a lot of the people who were members of the organization would write um, on Twitter and on blogs and other places online. So I used to um, tweet articles at the Mufti of ISIS, a man named Turki al-Bin Ali, who will, I wrote a profile, I tweeted it to him. Um, two weeks later, he was off of the internet forever. Um, so, but the interesting thing is, in about 2015, these men stop writing online, and there's a prohibition that put it put in place for people who belong to the group not to be um, online, not to be writing things under their name. Um, and that ends suddenly in mid-2017 when you see an eruption of protest over ideological issues. Um, and that's when groups, primarily the, the scholars in the organization, they start leaking documents, they start leaking their refutations, and you learn a lot more about what's been going on in the organization for some time. On the other side, what you have are super, I call them uber extremists, because they don't believe that ISIS is extremist enough. Um, and they, some of them would even declare tech fear of the caliph, the Bekr al-Baghdadi. Um, these people left the organization and they were on a platform called Telegram, which you may have heard of, and they were just leaking lots of inside information, documents, things that uh, allow us to piece together a lot of what was going on. So you have these people who start leaking a, an array of information beginning in 2017, and that is primarily what, what I'm drawing on. Uh, here. And you'll see, I'll, I'll show you some examples of, of these documents. But before I uh, launch into all of that, I have to unfortunately um, divert us to the 18th century um, because that is the founding of the Wahhabi movement in Saudi Arabia. And much of this debate in the Islamic State, as I'll, I'll argue, actually doesn't concern the Quran, doesn't concern the Sunnah. It concerns the proper understanding of Wahhabi doctrinal principles. So the Islamic State belongs to a movement called Jihadi Salafism, or Jihadism for short, and that the movement takes form in the 60s and 70s, and it's a radical outgrowth of the Muslim Brotherhood, but it gradually acquires over the following decades more of a Salafi or a Wahhabi uh, doctrinal orientation. It becomes more of a purist movement focused on eradicating what it calls shirk, uh, or polytheism. And for Groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, what shirk means is democracy ruling by other than God's law. And of course, Shiism, you can talk about sectarianism as well. Um, and these men, they draw these, these ideologues of the jihadi movement, they draw on the Wahhabis uh, for, um, to kind of, uh, I don't know, to, to root and to base their, their arguments. Um, and the Islamic State in particular would be very much influenced by Wahhabi exclusive uh, theology. Many of its publications are just official Wahhabi texts from the 18th and 19th century with very little commentary. Um, and in other publications by the group, you just see doctrinal, Wahhabi doctrinal principles. So it's important to understand what, what Wahhabism, the original Wahhabism, was all about. So it started um, by a man named Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, who lived and preached in the area of Nejd, which you can see there in the center of the Arabian Peninsula. And the main plank of his doctrine was what he called tawhid, strict monotheism, the opposite of which, in his view, was shirk, 
or polytheism. And he called on people to abandon shirk and return to tawhid. And the shirk that he was upset about was what he believed to be saint veneration or um, the worship of saints. And it was very common in this part of, of the Muslim world, as in other parts of the Muslim world, uh, for men to go to grave sites, to supplicate, to give offerings. And for Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, all of this was, was shirk, and the people who were participating in these cultic rituals were to be regarded as polytheists. And what he did is he, he argued in a series of epistles, and this relates to my other more historical work on Wahhabism, um, he would argue that if you want to be a true Muslim, you have to show enmity and hatred to people who are doing these cultic rituals at grave sites. And you, what is more, you have to do takfir, or you have to excommunicate these people. So to give you an idea of what these principles are like, um, here is an, an excerpt from a Wahhabi epistle. This is written by Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. The foundation of Islam and its principle are two commands. The first is the command to worship God alone without partner, to agitate for this, to show loyalty for the sake of it, and to pronounce takfir on those who do not practice it. The second is to warn against the association of other beings in the worship of God, to be harsh in this, to show enmity for the sake of it, and to pronounce takfir on those who practice it. So takfir is a very central part of Wahhabism as originally conceived. And the most um, off-cited uh, Wahhabi line about takfir is something that is called the third nullifier, which is the, the next uh, excerpt there. So Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab had a list of 10 so-called nullifiers, nawaqid, uh, is what he called their, the nullifiers of Islam. And they're things that if you do them, they expel you from the faith. The third of those things is not doing takfir. So he says, whoever does not pronounce takfir on the polytheists or has doubts about their unbelief or affirms the truth of their doctrine is an unbeliever by consensus. I think it's, man lam yukafir al-mushrikeen, o shakka fi kufrihim, o sahaha madhabahum kafara bil um, And this is cited all the time by in, the, in these doctrinal debates um, over, over uh, Wahhabism in the Islamic State, uh, which I will now come to. So there are a few phases in these ideological debates in the Islamic State. The first is the one I would call, uh, what I call the Hazimis, al Hazimis. Uh, the Hazimis were members of the Islamic State who were loyal to the ideas of a certain Saudi cleric named Ahmed al-Hazmi, who's pictured here. Um, interestingly enough, Ahmed al-Hazmi is not a jihadi, and he's never been a member of the Islamic State. But he was very influential, particularly in a, um, among Tunisians who joined the group. So following the revolution in 2010, he went to, Tun to Tunis uh, and surrounding areas, and he gave a series of lectures where he outlined the, an idea based on the third nullifier of Islam. So he basically was telling young Tunisians about the importance of takfir. And he um, innovated an idea, I think it's fair to say, called takfir al adir So there's an idea in Sunni Islam generally that um, if you commit an act of unbelief unwittingly, say you didn't know because you were ignorant that what you were doing, um, say praying at a gravesite, if you're a Wahhabi, was an act of unbelief, then you can be excused having committed unbelief because of your ignorance. It's called in Arabic, al-uvr bil jahl, excuse on the basis of ignorance. But for Ahmed al-Hazmi and his uh, acolytes, this was nonsense. There, it, it's not a valid concept. And so he proposed that the one who does um, the excusing, the adir, is himself to be subject to takfir. So, in his formulation, um, say somebody who votes in, in a democracy, that makes you, a, in his view, a kafir, an unbeliever. And that person has to be subject to takfir. And if there comes along somebody who says, well, he didn't know that that was an act of unbelief, and then Ahmed al-Hazmi would say, OK, well, you're a kafir now, too. Um, <laughs> so you can imagine this is a kind of a toxic doctrine. And it led to something that is called, um, would be called a tasalsul fi takfir, often translated as chain takfir. Um, I like to translate it as takfir ad infinitum, or something like, you know, like that. 
it's based on the example that I just gave. Um, so if if I vote in an election, and um, and you, Fanar, uh, say no, he was ignorant. Um, I'm not going to make tech fear of him. Well, then somebody else in the audience would say, okay, well then I'm going to make tech fear of Fanar, and then you know anyone who hasn't make tech fear of that person because he just excused. I mean, if somebody excuses, uh, you know. Anyone who doesn't consider you a kafir is then automatically subject to tech fear. Cascades. Yes, it cascades, and this is the problem. And so the Hazimis, um, they very quickly <laughs> earn this identity as the people who do to sell so in tech fear, who do tech fear ad infinitum. So they would actually, uh, the common example had concerned the leader of Al Qaeda at the time. There were people in the, in the group in, in ISIS who didn't, I mean, they, they didn't like Al Qaeda. But at the same time, they didn't want to subject Al Qaeda to tech fear because, you know, past loyalties. Um, but, but the Hazmis would say, okay, well, if you're not going to do tech fear of Ayman Zawahiri, he's a kafir, then then you're a kafir, and anyone who doesn't consider you a kafir is a kafir. And since a lot of people who didn't consider Ayman Zawahiri to be an unbeliever uh, were high-level commanders in ISIS, well, then they started to commit tech pronounce tech fear on all of those people. And since Baghdadi didn't commit tech fear on those people, well, they had to commit tech fear on, on Baghdadi. And so it, this spiraled out of control. And what happened is the Islamic State, oh, before I get to that, I just wanted to show Turki al-Bin Ali, who I mentioned before, he was a young Bahraini cleric. Um, he would write on, he wrote on Twitter in 2014 that tech fear al-Adr was an innovation and a dangerous innovation at that. Um, and he would write a lot of the um, the refutations of this idea, along with others in the Islamic State. What happens is um, we have a document from the the General Security Department of the Islamic State, which is about the phenomenon of extremism in ISIS. I know the, the irony is actually completely lost on me until just now that you have the Islamic State writing about the phenomenon of extremism in the Islamic State, um, which they say is a bad thing. <laughs> uh, but what, what they explain here, and this is from uh, November 2015, is that, and what they're complaining about are the Hazimis, and they talk about Ahmed al-Hazimi, and they talk about the third nullifier of Islam, and they talk about Tasel Sul fi Takfir, um, and they talk about the consequences, what, they, what, this, what this led to. So many of the so-called Hazimis were rounded up, um, they were imprisoned, detained, they were executed. A number of these men were actually prominent ISIS clerics who I had... Um, I had, whose works I had studied uh, before um, before this time, um, and and uh, in addition to that, a number of people fled. So they believed at the time. Okay, we've we've put this to bed. We ex extremism was a problem in ISIS, but thank goodness we got rid of it. Um, unfortunately, for a lot of the people in the Islamic State um, who had uh, different views, uh, this was not the end of. Of, of it, uh, Turki al-Bin Ali, for instance, who believed at this point that he had he had prevailed in this war, was about to be subject to uh, investigation, um, and we come to that now. Um, so the next phase after the Hazimis that are put to bed in, in 2014 and, and 2015 uh, concerns something that I call Al Furqan's middle way. So this refers to a man named Abu Muhammad Al Furqan who was the minister of media in the Islamic State. Um, he's an Iraqi. He was a very, very influential member of the group. As you can imagine, the place of media in the Islamic State is very important. Um, we've all seen the horrific videos. And Abu Muhammad al-Furqan uh, was in charge of, of that operation. So in February 2016, sort of as a follow-up to uh, the Hazimi issue, he formed something called the Ideological Committee or the Methodological Committee, Al-Lajna al manhajia uh, that has the purpose of investigating, or at the beginning it was just interviewing some of the so-called scholars in the Islamic State. And if I use the word scholars, I'm not, it's not an endorsement of their you know, scholarship. Uh, it's just the way that they self-present. Uh, so they call themselves ulama. These are men like Turkiya bin Ali, and there, there are you know, dozens, even hundreds of these people who were in the group, most of them, Thankfully, dead now. Um, in fact, pretty much everyone I mention here is dead. Just so you know. <laughs> um, so what what happened is, and this is a report that comes from July 2016. Um, 
it's about the findings of, of the methodological committee um, that Abu Muhammad al Furqan had set up. And, and what it explains is that they started interviewing the scholars in, in February 2016, and there were, there were some who still held to these very extremist ideas about tech fear. Some of them were accused of, of doing a tesselsul in tech fear. But the larger problem, the authors of this report say, was actually um, moderation in tech fear. Not enough tech fear. Um, restraint in tech fear, something that they called irja, which is a reference to an early Islamic theological movement um, that we call murjaism, um, which essentially uh, means postponing judgments of, of kufr, of tech fear, uh, on people. Um, so people like Turki bin Ali and, and others in the Islamic State, and they did interviews with some 60 scholars, and we have like what are basically amount to the minutes of a lot of these meetings that were leaked um, by people. Uh, you can see arguments uh, going back and forth. Um, a lot of it is really nitty gritty in the details of uh, issues on tech fear and or you wrote this and you didn't say that you know this is kufr when it is kufr and, and things like that um, but what happened as a result of, of these investigations is that El Furqan put out a statement um, which s tried to strike a balance between those he considered to be too extreme and too moderate when it came to tech fear um, so this is the statement that was issued um, in May 2016, it was issued by a very strange um, a body called the Central Office for Overseeing the Shari Sharia Department, Al-Maktab al-Markazi li Mutaba'at al-Dabawin al which no one would ever hear from again. Um, and it was about, uh, it concerned the issue of those who hesitate to pronounce takfir on polytheists, men, tawaqqafa fi takfir al-Mushrikeen. And it outlined uh, the two positions that it believed existed in the Islamic State that were errant. There were the extremists who argued that takfir um, is a foundation of the religion, that it is min asl adin, which is to say that it's a foundational religious principle, it's a paramount, it's primary, and if you don't engage in takfir, then you are automatically an unbeliever. Uh, whereas the murjaites, the moderates, this statement said, um, regard takfir as a mere requirement of the religion, min lewezim adin, something that, like prayer, you have to do, um, but does not automatically expel you from the faith if you if you neglect to do it. Um, the problem with this statement, however, was that it did not really resolve the tension. It, it really, what it it forbade anyone in the Islamic State from using this terminology of min asl adin, min lewezim adin. It basically tried to paper over the differences by saying. Yes, it's bad for people to hesitate to pronounce takfir. Like, takfir is, is good and we have to do it. Um, but it did leave some room for nuance. Um, but it wasn't exactly clear what, what this was about. And the scholars were really upset about the, the ambiguity that was created here. And a number of them, and these were documents that were leaked only just a few, a few months ago, um, were they complained to Baghdadi and to his, his aides about the content of this uh, statement on tech fear. So the, the, the letter on the left was addressed to something called the Delegated Committee, which was Baghdadi's executive council in the Islamic State, uh, saying that this just created a lot of ambiguity. We have no idea, um, you know, that, that these are issues that the scholars ought to resolve, not, not bureaucrats. Um, similar position was taken by the author of, of the uh, treatise in the center, and uh, Ibn Ali's um, outfit in the Islamic State, which was something called the Office for Research and Studies, tried to write a, um, a commentary on the statement on tech fear that would give a, a positive view of, of its views, of a more moderate position. But the, um, the publication of this commentary was blocked by people in the delegated committee. So you have these, these tensions at this time between those of, of moderate, relatively moderate and relatively more extremist uh, bent. And in the middle of it all are the kind of managers of the Islamic State. Uh, the rumor is that a lot of these men don't care uh, whether tech fear is to be classified like A or classified like B. They just don't want this to blow up into, into all out ideological warfare. And they seem to succeed at that um, in 2016, 
Um, but the problem was that Abu Muhammad al-Furqan died in an airstrike, and a lot of his uh, aides also died in airstrikes around this time. This is late 2016. And in early uh, 2017, the ideological committee is resuscitated, and more of the scholars are subject to investigation um, and inquiry. And this time, the leaders of the delegated committee, that is this executive council in the Islamic State, uh, they have it out for the more moderate types. And they completely side with the more extremist types uh, in the Islamic State, and they put out a statement in May 2017 it's a ta'amim, or a memorandum, um, which takes a firm position on takfir, saying that it is one of the manifest principles of the religion, min usul al-din al-zahira, um, which is essentially to take the view that it's a foundational religious principle. If you shirk it, if you don't do it, then you are an unbeliever. Um, and it complains, the statement complains, that the murja'ites, which is code for Turki bin Ali and his allies, the scholars in the group, that they're trying to strip the third nullifier of all meaning. Basically, they're trying to create um, more of an open, um, a less, more of an open um, uh, environment in the Islamic State, more welcoming, whereas um, we, the, the leaders, want to take a harder line. We want to be a purist organization. Um, so this is when, as I was alluding to earlier, um, there was a sort of breach in the firewall and all of the, uh, the pent-up energy and frustration uh, that you had seen among these scholars just came out immediately. Uh, people like Turki al-Bin Ali leaked refutations of this memorandum. The scholars basically were up in arms without any arms um, over its content. Um, so this is right um, just days after the, uh, this memorandum from uh, May 2017 is released. Turki bin Ali, he writes the, uh, the letter on the left. It's a letter to the delegated committee complaining about uh, what they had done. Um, he says that they had reversed the position that was Furkan's uh, theological consensus from the year prior, and they had essentially endorsed uh, al-Hazimi's ideas and all these things, and that they were going to create um, you know, hell for the organization if they didn't reverse course. Uh, so what happened to Turki bin Ali? Twelve days later, he dies in an airstrike. Um, all of these people just, you know, you know it's normal in the Islamic State, but um, it became a um, source of a conspiracy theory because Turki bin Ali was not the only one in this group to criticize the memorandum and then die in an airstrike. Um, so this happened again with a man named Abu, uh, what's his name? Uh, Abdul Bar Salahi, a Kuwaiti, he wrote a refutation uh, of the memorandum. Uh, it was uh, leaked online, I think, a month later. He was imprisoned uh, for having refuted the memorandum along with some 60 of his allies, and they all died in an airstrike. And the, um, the rumor or the conspiracy theory was created that the members of the delegated committee were leaking the coordinates of the scholars to the coalition so that they could coalition would get rid of their, their theological enemies, um, which is widely believed today by people who um, subscribe to the views of, of these scholars. Um, the harshest refutation was written, is the one on the right here, it was written by a man named Abu Muhammad al-Hashimi, and he is the one who calls out these men for, for you know, uh, putting these men in prison and then leaking the coordinates uh, to the coalition. I don't know if it's true, um, but I wouldn't put it past them. This was uh, a pretty uh, serious controversy. Um, so serious, in fact, that Baghdadi uh, intervened, and um, if things weren't confusing enough, uh, that May 2017 position on Tekfir was withdrawn. So in September 2017, a new memorandum comes out from the delegated committee saying, actually, that previous position on tech fear, that was wrong, and uh, we're going to return to the truth. And yeah, it gets complicated, doesn't it? I'm actually confused about one thing, so yeah. it's complicated. <laughs> why is Turkey bin Ali, why was he against the memorandum if he's a hardcore Hazmi? Oh, he's, no, he's an anti-Hazmi, if I, I must have okay. suggested the wrong thing. 
he was one yeah. of the cascaders. Oh, no. He, um, um, he was completely against oh, the so. cascading idea. Right. So he was a, a Morjite, according to the more extremist types. Um, so he, he refuted that, that statement. Um, and he is kind of the, the patron saint of this more moderate trend, uh, relatively moderate trend in the Islamic State. Um, so what happened is after this memorandum was withdrawn, an audio series was issued adopting all the views uh, that had been espoused by Turkey bin Ali and others. Um, so essentially the Islamic State seesawed on its position on Tekfir. And a lot of the more extremist types in the delegated committee were arrested. Uh, the man who had led the charge in writing that memorandum was imprisoned and later executed. Um, and we, have a, we even have letters that he wrote to Baghdadi uh, complaining about the rise of these Morjaites and that by empowering the Morjaites, Baghdadi, you're going to destroy the Islamic State. Um, and a lot of these people, a lot of the participants in these battles believe that if the Islamic State takes the wrong view on Tekfir, uh, that it's going to destroy the Islamic State. Um, and so you see today uh, people claiming that the Islamic State took the wrong position on Tekfir, and that's why um, the organization failed, um, things like that. Okay, um, just to clarify, so this audio series, which came out in September 2017, um, it made, this, made the argument very clear that uh, Tekfir is one of the requirements of the religion. So it went back, it went from its Min Asaladin to its Min Loez Imadin again. This, you know, maybe just minutia, but uh, interesting uh, to some of us, perhaps. Um, and yet, uh, the confusion continues, uh, Fanar, because you'd think, okay, the scholars finally won. They got it. The extremists are in prison. But uh, the people in power in the Islamic State were still um, not too keen on these men. And they continued to arrest a lot of them. And a lot of these men, these scholarly types, uh, they continued to leak documents online uh, through Telegram and other places. Uh, their leader, a man named Abu Yaqub al Maqdisi, was rounded up. He was imprisoned and later executed. One of the charges against him was that he was communicating with a pro-Al-Qaeda scholar in Jordan named Abu Muhammad al Maqdisi. Um, and eventually what happens is these, these men come to the conclusion that the reason the Islamic State is failing is because of this clique of people who have power in the group who they consider to be extremists and oppressors. And that's the, the new turn here is that the scholars start to accuse the leadership of being oppressive, of not listening to them, of not obeying God's law, of not uh, showing up to court when there is a dispute. Um, so in May, June 2018, one of these men in a, in a sermon states, what has befallen us, what has broken our back, divided our authority and empowered the enemies of God over us is oppression and extremism in religion. And what happens to that man, Abu Musa Abu Sahrawi? Anyone? Airstrike. He dies in an airstrike. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry to have a laugh at uh, his expense. Um, and he died in an airstrike in November 2018, along with about five or six other uh, leading men in this, in this category. Um, whose images were then broadcast by some of their allies who took pictures and they were writing um, about the things that were going on and complaining. Uh, but even at this point, even in November 2018, um, was it 2018? Yeah, to November 2018, after all these people had been killed, um, the scholarly types in ISIS were still loyal to Baghdad. They, they were under the impression the illusion, they would later determine, that Baghdadi was not actually calling the shots. Um, it was his deputies who were doing that. And his deputies, um, and if only, and the idea that they had was, if only we could reach Baghdadi, um, he would set everything straight. And everything would go back to normal. Um, the problem is, they would later discover, Baghdadi actually didn't care for them at all. Um, he was concerned with the survival of his organization. And when they learned that, how they learned that, I'm not entirely sure. But in March uh, 2019, the scholars began to say no more. And one of them wrote a 200-page book called Kufulayadi an Bayat al-Baghdadi, or Withdraw Your Hands from the Bay'a, or Allegiance to Baghdadi, um, basically making the argument that the Islamic State is, is no more, 
no more, it's no good anymore. Uh, Baghdadi was not our ally, uh, and there's nothing left for us to do other than uh, call for people to break uh, ties with the organization. Um, and that is what the remaining scholars uh, from the group did, though most of them are dead. Um, so over time, uh, this is the last thing I want to mention about this. Um, they, well, so they, they leave the organization. But many of them uh, continue to write online. Um, they claim that they used to be scholars in the group and they leak a lot of interesting details. Uh, when Baghdadi was killed this past October and a new caliph was, was put in place, for example, uh, these men who used to belong to ISIS, they would write, uh, they wrote a couple of articles making fun of the new caliph for um, the fact that we didn't know who he was, that he was Mejhul, um, saying that you can't give bay'a in Islamic law to somebody that you, whose identity you don't know. Um, particularly when the people who have vetted this man, given him bay'a in the first place, are also people that we don't know. Um, and so, now, the influence of these writings is, is difficult, I think, uh, to assess. But it's, it's interesting to see these, these people still alive. Some of them have uh, forged contacts with Al-Qaeda scholars as well, or pro-Al-Qaeda types online, and particularly Abu Muhammad al-Maqdisi in Jordan. Um, but they don't seem to be quite at the point where they're going to forge some kind of alliance there. Um, so I return uh, here at the end to the question that I raised at the beginning, which is how much does all of this matter? Um, there's an argument that it's really just a sideshow, um, interesting to people like me, uh, who find the, the minutia of tekfir and the arguments over it to be fascinating. Um, but at the same time, it's quite clear that this didn't produce rifts in the group, as in hundreds or thousands of people you know, leave the group and pick up, take up arms and try to revolt. It didn't have that, that kind of effect. Um, so it's unclear to me, and the other problem is, this is a secretive organization. Um, it's, there's a lot of things that are spoken out loud that we just don't know um, if they're true. Um, I think it's fair to say that the, these kinds of disputes that they undermine, to some extent at least, the sense of unity in the group, um, the esprit de corps, um, that's why you, you see um, so many people who are parties to this group complaining that ISIS is failing because they took the wrong position on Tekfir. There are lots of um, vignettes I've seen, lots of little stories about uh, these people became convinced that the Islamic State was oppressive and extremist and that's why they left. Um, even sometimes the interviews with the people in the al Hol camp in Syria, you'll find these arguments made to the news media. I don't think that people have any idea what they're talking about when they say, oh, they were oppressive and extremist, but you'll find those arguments made and that they may in fact, be sincere. Um, one other reason to, I think, um, another, another point that's worth making is that the Islamic State certainly thought and continues to think that these matters are important, or else they wouldn't have devoted so much attention to them. They wouldn't have written these memoranda. Um, and what I've shown you is really just scratching the surface of the, the, the number of words that these people spent uh, when they were under you know, bombardment by the United States and its allies, they were fixated on, you know, is Tekfir min Asaladin or is it min Lewezimadin? And let's imprison those people who think otherwise from us. Um, and so the group clearly believed that this was important. The fact that Baghdadi changed course late in 2017, that he executed one of these more extremist people, um, shows that there was an effort to kind of keep this, to keep this uh, at bay. Um, but I would argue that the greatest impact these ideological disputes uh, has is probably on the future. I think that uh, the Islamic State has alienated a great many potential recruits who are well aware of these conflicts. They're well aware of the incoherence of the ideology. Um, they're well aware of the stories of, uh, of commanders who summarily executed dozens of people trying to leave the group, these kinds of things. Um, so I think that that will make caliphal renaissance all the more difficult, hopefully. Um, for the time being, uh, you have an organization that is not defeated by any means, but whose kind of purpose, its 
its stated ideological purpose is kind of a miss. Oh, thank you. Thank That's you. That's it.